Hey, Will, thanks for joining us today as a way of getting started. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Hey, good morning. It's great to be here. Uh, well, let's see. I'm a 46-year-old male, about 5'9". No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, spent my entire career in sales. Um, right out of college, went to work for a great company called ADP. Yep. Got some incredible training. Uh, went on to be a sales trainer, um, worked in a few different divisions, um, spent six and a half years there, and went into the surgical implant business as a rep. Uh, stayed in healthcare ever since. I've done a multitude of different things in the healthcare sector, whether it's surgical implants, um, nationalizing a lab, um, co-founding a, a genetics company, and even being a little bit in healthcare IT. So I've done a lot. I would say the last 15 years has primarily been on the healthcare side of the business. Yeah. What was that by accident or on purpose or just? No, you know, it, it was all planned. Um, <laughs> As crazy and creepy as that sounds, right? Uh, I, I met a gentleman when I was young in, in college who was a very sharp individual, and I wanted to kind of be like him, and I want to know what he did. And so he was in the surgical implant industry. Um, so I said, how do I do that? And he says, go work at Xerox, Pitney Bowes, or ADP, knock out two or three years, and then hopefully you can make the jump. So I went to ADP, my two to three years turned into... Uh, six and a half years, and wow. then I went into a startup surgical implant company uh, selling implantable spinal cord stimulators and uh, got promoted from that company into a regional manager role. It was responsible for building out a sales team from scratch in South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida, and uh, we got acquired, and after that, I went on to be a VP of sales for a, a lab, and it's just it was all planned. Like I've always known I wanted to be in healthcare. The body fascinates me. Um, what the, what medications can do to the body, what implants can do to the body. So it was all planned as, as whack as that sounds. Now it's, it's a pretty tough market, isn't it? Because are you selling to doctors? Are you selling to hospital administrators, hospital? Um, yeah. Yeah. With all of the roles, all of the above. Yeah. Um, but I tell you, it, it, I meet a lot of young people and I know you talk to a lot of young people too, and they're hungry and they're in sales. They're like, you know what? I want to be in medical device sales, right? Cause it's, it's sexy. You can make a lot of money. It, you know, it's a challenge. It's super challenging, but the hardest part of medical device is not actually getting up in 5 AM and grinding every day. The hardest part is actually getting in getting to that in. industry. The, the industry or to talk to the doctor or, to get in, to actually get the job, yeah, right? So um, B2B reps that have a strong sales training, right? They, they've sold copiers. They know how to bang on doors, uh, get a million no's, a million rejections, yeah. uh, but they know how to do a consultative sale. Those individuals have a shot uh, starting at a very low level in the surgical world or what people would call the medical device world. And uh, the hardest part, like I said, is just getting in. Once you get in, what, my, what I found was um, I thought, wow, you know, hey, I made it. I'm going to be a medical device rep. I'm going to sell it to surgeons in the OR, and I just hope I can keep up. That was like my mentality. But what I found out was once I got in there, 90% of those reps did not have the sales training background that I did, and they were kind of pulling the old school salesman approach of, Hey, you want to play golf this weekend? And you know, why don't we do dinner tomorrow night? You know, just relationship BS. And that is a big part of it. But uh, the actual tactics of how to gain access and how to add value and establish rapport and build trust. And um, that, that those were some skill sets that uh, I was kind of surprised weren't really there. And what was the mix between inbound and outbound? Was there any inbound or? No, it's, it's, 100% it's outbound. <laughs> totally seek, find and grind. Right. Uh, so you're literally cold calling. And I think that's why they like the hardcore B2B reps. In fact, I know that that's why, um, you know, there are, there's always going to be an incumbent vendor that yeah. they've been working with for years. They've had relationship. I mean, deep relationships where you do, you know, the physician will invite you to their kids' birthday parties and you're inviting them to your wedding. And so years and years of that, that's really hard to take mm. down. Yeah. So you better have some disruptive technology. You better be very likable, 
credible, relatable, and trustworthy, and you better have some badass sales skills. So let's get into that. Uh, how would you get in? Let's say going up to Brian, Dr. Brian over here, and mm -hmm. um, I have no awareness of what you do. But right. I'm a perfect match. How, how would you get to talk to me? Well, uh, you would have to go into, you'd have to get permission to be in the hospital, right? That's a whole another set of hurdles. But once you get clearance within the hospital through your company, uh, you basically are waiting at the scrub sink <laughs> in the operating room. I swear to God, you're waiting at the scrub sink. You're looking, right. You're looking through the window and you're watching this surgery go down yeah. and your competitor is in there with him and your competitor sees you in the window yeah. just waiting. And then when he walks out or she walks out, you know, they give you stink eye because they know what's going on. And then, you know, the physician's coming out of the case. They're probably exhausted said they got to run to another case, but you've got to find something so compelling, you know, like people talk about an elevator pitch. I'm talking, you know, a fraction of that time. You got five, eight seconds. Yeah. So what, what line you cast out there better have a strong hook. And what would interest them? It's not money, saving money. It's saving lives, being able to move their career forward or save more yeah. patients. Yeah, it, it could be any number of things depending on their specialty. Yeah. Some, uh, some surgeons just want a disruptive technology that will change the game. Yeah. Some want something that will be easier to use and make them go from case to case faster so they're not spending as much time in the operating room. And then depending on whether or not they're employed by the hospital or they are in, you know, independently uh, running their own practice, then they'll be concerned about, well, how can we partner up and how can you help me grow my business? Okay. So, and you found that more effective than trying to get into their office? Well, that's the other side. So it's a, it's a two prong approach, right? You've also got to do that. And that's a, <laughs> so when they're in their office, uh, they've got set times and you've got to, you know, kind of schmooze the people at the front, find out what the schedule is and when he or she as a physician is going to be a, what office location yeah make sure you show up during those times um you know unfortunately you're gonna have to sometimes bring in the lunch just to get 30 seconds of their time yeah right so and then you also have to do what we call the the total office call you've got to be besties with the gate keeper you've got to know all the nursing staff the mas and and you basically have to be a part of their team uh before they'll even help get you in front of that doctor so there's a it's a process there's no question um and you've got to you've got to deliver some value for everyone at every level um so it's it's a great way to become an, a well-rounded salesperson i would say yeah, because I, I, I always thought I, I never sold a single medical product. I was always on the the IT side, so I was mm. dealing with uh, people with different issues. Right. But I always thought you know doctors are selling to lawyers. When you're selling to people who get paid based off of mostly their time, or their time is a very limited asset. Mm -hmm. You know, like if you go into a dentist, they have you know four chairs in a row. And the guy just right. walks from room to room and everybody gets everything ready for them. Correct. Yeah. So, and I'm sure you're like one of those rooms. It's yes. like, okay, today I have five minutes to learn about what's new. Yep. Yep. Yeah. As sales reps, that is exactly the role that they have to play, right? It, yeah. it takes time. These are busy people. These are very important people. And most times they know that they're important. So they're going to just keep running. And what you have to bring to the table is not that important. So it's right, because the, the, there's no active pain on their part. Is that true? Correct. Yeah. Correct. And I don't know medical sales that well. And in the hierarchy, is like pharmaceutical sales kind of the bottom, or is it? You know, there are a lot of like sales. There's so many different levels or layers of sales. Right? Are you selling vacuum cleaners door to door, or are you selling? Um, right. You know devices on how to split the atom. I, I don't know. So uh, the healthcare world is very similar to that. Yeah. There are, you could say, well, yeah, well, I'm in medical sales. Okay. Well, that can mean a lot of things. Well, what do you sell? Well, uh, I sell oxygen tanks to hospitals, right? Yeah. So that's like, that's one level. And there's another level of, well, I sell like 
sutures and needles and bandages to doctors' offices. And then there's more intense like equipment where, uh, in fact, there's a hot new technology out right now in the dialysis world that is game changing. Um, and I don't know what many people know about dialysis, but usually those patients have to go to a dialysis center and spend many hours and it just wipes them out the process they go through. And they come out of there just completely uh, left with no energy. Now there's this little box um, that has completely revolutionized the industry. It's quicker, it's more efficient, and it's easier on the patient. Yeah. So that is a what we call capital sales. That is a different level. And then there's the surgical side, uh, which is usually implants or some kind of uh, electrocautery device or something that would be used during a procedure. And what was the sales cycle like? Let's say you, you met the doctor at the scrub place. He had uh, the latent pain went to active pain where he had a patient that mm -hmm. he felt was a good match for what you're talking about. Then what would happen? Yeah. So like, let's take the spine world, for example, um, the, the relationship that a surgeon bonds with their rep over time is just intensely deep. Like I said, but let's just say that, you know, they're using these things called pedicle screws and they're and this is to, to stabilize the spine. And maybe he's having a problem over and over with this type of screw and it keeps breaking. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, he sees you out in the scrub sink. He knows you've been coming by the office. He knows you've been hustling his, his staff trying to get in. He might give you a crack just because you're there at that time when he's frustrated. He's like, all right, this is the tipping point. I need to try something different. So it's, it's timing, it's luck of the draw, and it's just relentless pursuit uh, to try and win. But, but then you, that's not a sale. You have interest. How does he evaluate it to see if he wants to make it part of his practice? Right. So that's not a sale. That's called a, an opportunity or a chance. <laughs> He's throwing you a bone, right? 90%. <laughs> right, right. I'm just not asking for a handout, just a hand, right? Uh, no. So in that scenario, he would try your, your screws or your plates, pins, whatever you've got, rods. And if it went well, you'd see him at the scrub sink and you'd, you'd say, I'd say, doc, so what'd you think? Oh, it was pretty good. Oh yeah. What'd you like? What didn't you like? And, you know, and you have that typical sales conversation yeah. and if it went well, it might open the door for you to do it again. Yeah. You have to, you have to seize that moment. Uh, if it didn't go well, you're done. Now, now how about as far as, you know, are they the economic decision maker or they're the technical decision maker? Meaning that yeah. they don't buy it. The hospital buys it or do they buy it? Excellent question. So most physicians and surgeons. If I can ask you to put your mic near your mouth. Oh. Most physicians and surgeons today are employed by a hospital. Okay. So they're never the economic buyer. Yeah. If they own their own practice and they're doing procedures in their practice, or maybe they own a surgery center and they're doing procedures there, then they're the financial buyer. And boy, do they care about that number. Yeah. So what I really found amazingly interesting coming from B2B to uh, the device world was that your, your end user buyer, you know, the user buyer never has to pay for it. Right. Which is crazy. Like what other, what other sales job is there where that's your audience? Oh, I sold to the government and, uh, Ooh. yeah, <laughs> that, that, that was the go? good part. Right. Okay. So, you know, you have things like nine 11 happen and all of a sudden, you know, they tell certain manufacturers, you do not sell anything to anyone else until we have everything we need. Wow. And then send us a bill. <laughs> you know, it's kind of nice. Well, medicine, you know, you're saving lives. And if the doctor says, you know, I need this, and then is up, almost up to, is it up to the hospital to say why they can't do it or? It is. So the end user is the physician. Uh, they want the best technology and they want a great competent rep. Uh, but obviously before that can even get in his hands, we as, a, as an entity or a company have to get approved by the hospital. Okay. And there's a whole process that is involved in that, right? To go in front of these committees and smack committee and present your case and provide clinical data as to why your device is different, why it's better clinically in showing facts and data that proves that. Wow. Then, you know, compared to what they already have, 
And that's a big, big process. And so you've got to build champions within that hospital or within that surgical team that will speak for you to help kind of back you up. So if you can get that back up from the surgeons, uh, if you've got that clinical data that's relevant and game changing, uh, that's step one, step two, and then step three is going to be the financial hurdle because yeah. they're going to look at you and they're going to say, well, hey, you know, you've got XYZ widget. Um, it costs X, but these, these two competitors of yours have the same widget. This is what they tell you, whether it's the same or not. It's the exact same widget. <laughs> yeah. And they're 20% less because they're a corporate conglomerate and they give us massive discounts. Yeah. So there's a lot of, lot of different games you got to play. It's, it's a fun world for sure. And give me a sense of the time. Is it, uh, let's say you, when there is active, we, you get the person's attention, they're interested, you're going through the hospital process. Mm -hmm. Is that nine months, a year, longer? The, yeah, the farther back in time you go, the quicker and easier it was. Nowadays, <laughs> that process could take anywhere from one month to, geez, worst case scenario, probably 12 months. Yeah. It, it just depends. And, and, you know, healthcare, you and I both know this, has changed so much in the last 10 years. It's turning into a nightmare, isn't it? It is. And yeah. it's kind of this Pandora's box that no one really has the answer of how to fix. Um, so there, there's just so many different levels and layers that we have to climb through to make things work. Even yeah. though, you know, you've got the best product on the planet, it's going to help thousands of patients man, there's a lot of hoops to go through now. Right, because it's not like capital equipment where, you know, there's an ROI. Correct. Right? You're, yes, you're saving somebody's life, but if that person's life can't afford it, then who can? Now, yeah. it's, now we're pushing it to the government, but the government can't afford it either. <laughs> Let's face it. No. On a is, card already. Is, is 17 trillion a lot of debt? I don't know. <laughs> Compared to me, yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> Compared to most people, no. Yeah. And I think that's the, the paradox that we're creating with all this great medical equipment mm -hmm. is that, you know, the number of people that can afford it is pretty limited. It is. But the people who need it is... It's all of us. Very elastic. Right. Yeah. You know, and you know, all this negotiations. And then, because then you have to ask, why does the hospital care? about the costs because they're passing it on to the patient. Right. And so <laughs> you, you, they if, hope to pass it on to the patient. Right. Well, right. You would think that it's a simple process, right? It's like, all right, this cost X, uh, yeah. we'll pass that on to Brian's uh, blue cross blue shield policy and we'll get reimbursed as a hospital and we're even right. Or maybe we're even up yeah. uh, in some cases that is true and they do make a profit. Uh, but there are other times where, depending on your level of insurance or who your carrier is, they completely jam the hospital. Yeah. And then there's the worst case scenario of, you know, the patient comes out and says, Oh my gosh, I just, you know, I was admitted for two nights in the hospital and my bill was $38,000 or whatever. And they're freaking out because they can't believe it. But what people don't understand is that, you know, they think these hospitals are making billions and millions of dollars and they're not they're scraping by at one and 2% profit margins at the end of the year, because for every one of you or I who walks in the door, there are two, three, nowadays, maybe even four, who has no insurance. Yep. And they don't pay. They, don't pay. they walk out with that $38,000 bill, they make 28 grand a year, and they're never gonna pay that back. So the hospital has to eat that. Wow. And, and I don't know, you know, what the government can do about it. They're not going to do anything about it. Uh, these private insurers, they're here to make a profit. And the hospital is just kind of stuck sitting there holding the bag of, man, how are we going to survive and, and make this work? Well, that's it. Because it's not like a restaurant where you, you want lobster, but you can't afford lobster. You know, you mm -hmm. go to the hospital, it's life or death. So it's at that emotional survival level that everybody's, you know, the urgency is there. Right. Yeah. Um, give us an idea of the pricing, you know, are these hundred K deals? Are they million dollar deals? Or are they? Mm. So they're all over the board. You mentioned capital equipment earlier, which is a, a big sector of it. And those yeah. are, 
those can be six figure deals every time, sometimes in the millions, right? Depending on, did you sell it to one location or do they have, you know, there's some hospital systems that have 28, 50 locations now. Yeah. Did you get that whole deal? And then you're talking a two, $3 million deal. It's insane. And then as far as going way down market to just basic procedures where um, maybe there's just like an interventional scope or something like that, that costs a couple hundred bucks. Yeah. Uh, my biggest stint in the OR in the surgical world was an implantable spinal cord stimulator. And those, uh, just the device itself, probably about that time, 24 grand. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. Sure. And it, would they hold inventory or was it purely on demand? For things that are that costly, they usually want that on demand. Yeah. With and a pre-negotiated agreement of some kind. Correct. You know, if they're, if they're a, a device or an instrument that's used frequently and it's less expensive, they'll keep that on the shelf. Yeah. And they'll just, you know, the nurses will plug and play and the scrub tech will walk around and, and give the physician what they need. Uh, if it's a little bit more costly, we or the sales rep would bring that into the OR. So they're responsible for not just selling, closing, managing their deals. They've got to manage their own inventory as well. Yeah. Now for the people listening that say, Hey, I, you know, I flunked out of biology in junior high, you know, how much medical education did you need? Uh, literally <laughs> zero. <laughs> uh, but you know, it was because I went to a startup that was very, aggressive. Yeah. And I was a very hungry young man who was well-trained. And those two things at that particular time married up really well. Uh, this was an organization that believed that, hey, uh, you can be, you know, I, we don't care how clinically sound you are or who you know. It was more about, listen, who are you as a person? What are your values? Um, you know, how much integrity do you have? And what, what, skills do you have? Can you, are you an incredible salesperson? Because if you are, we're going to give you the clinical knowledge that you lack. Yeah. And then we're going to rely on your skills and training of the past uh, to win once we combine those two and those two merge together after training. And how long did it take you to become comfortable having that uh, technical clinical conversation with a surgeon? Uh, fortunately, I was given some really good clinical training, so it didn't take too long, I would say, to feel, well, here's the problem. Feeling comfortable and knowing what you're talking about are right. two different things. You say things, the right? words, you don't know the meaning. Right, right, right. <laughs> like, okay, did I pronounce that right, right? That sounds yeah. sound smart. Um, I felt comfortable within six months. It felt yeah. great. But the you're in six months or a year, two years, your scope of knowledge in that field, whatever it is, is so limited that you're going to eventually get exposed, right? So you're comfortable. I'm like, hey, we're talking the smack. We're, we're doing it. Right. But then they talk about something that's outlandish that doesn't happen that often. And you have no idea what that word means or how to fix it. Right. Because certainly so, with doctors, you have a whole nother language, you know, do. and they like to yes. talk their own language. And so, I mean, three to six months to be comfortable having what's probably a 30 minute conversation about what the product does, how it works, how it right. compares to somebody else. That's still pretty good. Mm -hmm. You know, because most people, most reps I talk to, they don't want to make a change because they think it's insurmountable. They would think they have to go to medical school or right. you know, undergraduate in biology or whatever. Yeah. And, you know, and no, you have to learn a, probably a 30 to 60 minute conversation. Mm -hmm. That single thread, and it's going to get off track. <laughs> to kickstart it, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and it's it's a process. Some things are more clinically um, deep than others. You yeah. know, if you're in the world of oncology and biotech and things like that, that's you've got to be pretty buttoned up. Um, but like I said, I was just blessed because I had a great training program that I went through. And, you know, as, as we get older, we get different experiences and exposure to different cultures and business and different leadership and business. And those are two things that are huge for me uh, because they are the foundation of, of whether or not that entity is going to have a successful team. And so coming from such great background of ADP training and then this, this startup surgical training, um, 
I, I just assumed that's how the world worked. And then as I got older and went to different companies, I realized, wait a minute, you want to arm the reps with a couple PowerPoints and a, an hour long training session and you think they're going to succeed? Well, that's it. Yeah. And I know in the IT world, that's kind of what they do, right? Well, in the IT world, they, what they do is they pair up the rep with uh, an engineer. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the problem, of course, is all the rep can do is get the meeting and introduce the engineer and then close at the end for the next step. And, he, he, and it, it's like doctors talking for that 55 minutes in between. Gotcha. And they don't do very well because they don't understand what's going on. Correct. And, and the engineer's um, focus is talking tech. That's what excites them. It's not convincing them of the problem that you fix and how it will enhance their lives. So uh, what I did is <laughs> I, I, did, I inversed it. I would do the presentation. I'd let the engineer do the demo, but okay. I would learn what I was selling and why they would want to do it differently and how it was different than the competition. But it's still, gotcha. you know, it, it's still, you know, an hour, two hour conversation. Right. And, you know, of course they could blow me away, but the things that they were talking about blowing me away on didn't matter. Right. You know, I'd write them down and I use it as a great reason for a next step. Yeah. Yeah, you mentioned a really interesting point. Uh, you know, you bring in the expert. This is the technical guru. Yeah. And man, they know everything about the, the, the product um, in, in a language that I could never even get to, right? But here you are probably in the IT world surveying the room, reading body language, right. taking notes, listening to their question, and knowing that there's a deeper meaning to the question than just the surface level because we're trained as salespeople, right? right? Yeah. Um, so that's interesting. It kind of, did it, did it work? Because here's the sales guy and then here's the technical guy. And if you can merge them together and if they can play Batman and Robin really well. Right. That was the key. Like I had the same engineer for three different jobs over 12 years. Nice. Yeah. So yeah. That, that was very beneficial, obviously, right? Yeah. So you had the mojo going. And, you know, you know, we'd have a sequence, you know, like when you're talking and I start to talk, that's my signal that you stop talking. <laughs> talking and the customer starts talking, we both stop talking. Correct. And it's sales 101. Well, but you got to understand, then there was no other engineer I ever dealt with that could adhere to that rule. Okay. They would just go on and on and on and eat up that hour. And the objective of the hours, you know, to build interest, differentiate, create enough interest for a next step. Right. And if you go down the rat hole of these little nuances, that, yeah, that you should talk about maybe two months from now, the yeah. hour goes like this and you've got nothing accomplished. Correct. So, and what I have found, because I've overlapped with some you know, some of these engineers on the, on the IT side, as well as these biomedical engineers, they love to go down the rabbit hole. Of course, that's, the, that's their bag. Love it. Yeah. The, that's where they're, they feel they add value. Totally. And they do, they but do. just not right then. <laughs> yeah. It's like bringing an accountant along and he fills you in in the in next year's tax law that has right. nothing to do with anything. <laughs> right. But they're all fired up about it. And they want to tell everyone, right? Yeah. Yeah. So who does the best in medical? Is it the people that sell probably the renewables, the supplies? Is it the people, the embedded equipment versus the, like the robots, the Da Vinci's? Is it? So, yeah, that's, a, that's an amazing question. Equipment sale versus the disposable sale. And it takes a different kind in terms of who does better or who is better. It's a um, different, go ahead. Maybe better is the wrong word. I guess if you had to do it all over again, would you, would you have done it differently or? I would not have only yeah. because um, like take a capital equipment salesperson, for example, they are hunt and kill straight up. Yeah. You have this widget, you've got this territory and these hospitals and you're just hunting. All right, nail that one. All right, onto the next, nail that one. Boom, boom, boom. That's, man, those people make a lot of money and they are grinders, right? Yeah. They're not 
and, and I'm not opposed to that. I'm all about that. But I got more enjoyment out of uh, personal satisfaction and enjoyment out of doing the disposable side because I'm more of a relationship guy. Yeah. And with disposables, you're in these procedures a lot of the time. And you're just adding value in the OR, which makes you feel great. They appreciate it. Um, you're having conversations. Hey, what are you doing this weekend? You know, and I know you're laying there with your chest wide open or whatever, but believe it or not, these people are having like normal conversations. Uh, and, and so you build that relationship and, and rapport and you make some great friendships out of it. So yeah. I, that's, and so a relationship type salesperson, because there's so many different kinds of sales guys right. and girls um, that just worked well for me. Cool. And were you able to get some compounding, meaning like you get one doctor to like it? Could you get referrals and introductions to others? Yeah, if you were smart, you would. You would leverage that. You'd yeah. say, you know, Dr. Brian and I have been doing business together for X amount of time. Um, he speaks highly of you. He just recommended I give you a ring. What do you, you know, can I, can I sit in one of your cases? Can we meet for lunch or whatever the case may be? Um, and then leverage that relationship. In fact, take those two doctors together. Yeah. Dinner, right. Yeah. Spend a night out at that prospect's favorite restaurant with your buddy, buddy doc and let them work their magic. Cause to what you said earlier, you're hundred percent right. They love to talk their talk and their language. Right. And yeah. then what ends up happening is after a few glasses of wine, they're just in the zone and you're just sitting there like, <laughs> looking at their watch. The check. <laughs> you're like, dude, is this going to work or what? <laughs> and then, uh, you know, and then it, it, most times it always worked out. So I was, thankful for that. Cool. Hey, there's been yeah. a great conversation. Uh, where can people go to connect with you and learn more about your work? Yeah, you know what? Uh, probably the best spot would be LinkedIn. So it would be linkedin.com forward slash in forward slash Will Richter, R-I-C-H-T-E-R.